the reductions in mortality are really impressive. You reduce the probability of dying by 50% of a cardiovascular event. The study that identified this massive 16-fold increase in growth hormone, they had people do this. It's crazy. It has been shown to be beneficial for wound healing, acne, skin, eyes, can increase testosterone and sperm production. If you want to get a really big growth hormone release for sake of metabolism, fat loss, so as an all-around fitness program, what you end up with is I'll start with heat and cold really quickly and just say that avoid cold immersion. So ice baths and being in cold water up to the neck, uncomfortably cold within the four hours after a, a training session that's designed to evoke an adaptation, either endurance, hypertrophy, or strength, because the inflammation that you experience from a hard endurance workout or from a hard strength or a hard or hypertrophy workout is the stimulus that you're going to adapt to. The cold water immersion reduces inflammation and can short circuit some of that. After four hours, you're probably okay, but if you can do it a different day or you can do it before those sessions, that's better. Heat, however, can be done immediately after training and it's probably beneficial because of the way that it dilates the vascular system and delivers, perfuses the muscles and ligaments, et cetera, with more nutrients. The way I posed the question to him about cold was, I hear that getting into an ice bath or a cold water immersion after training can reduce hypertrophy, but I'm guessing it's not that big of a deal. And he said, no, it is a big deal. It will short circuit your progress. Now for people that are only interested in performance who are doing a lot of workouts and trying to recover, but not trying to grow muscle, get stronger or build endurance, mm -hmm. then it makes sense to do cold. Cause like it, skill development. Or skill development, or you're an athlete in season, you know, so you have to, What's so great about Andy is he really points out the specific ways to train given your specific goals. Now, in terms of training, he has this beautiful three by five concept for strength. Pick three exercises, compound exercises, multi-joint uh, movements. Do them for, do three to five exercises for three to five repetitions per set. Rest three to five minutes and do that three to five times per week. What's interesting about this is three to five times a week is a lot for a muscle group. Squatting th five times a week for five reps, meaning you're working pretty heavy, meaning you're close to failure, but not failure on, for strength generally. What Andy taught me is that people who are training mostly for strength can do these low rep type regimens frequently because most of the adaptation is neural. And because you're not pushing to failure in most cases, you don't get that sore. And so it's the motor neurons getting the muscle fibers to contract more intensely or with more efficiency in other ways that's leading to these strength gains. And this is why powerlifters can train every day or five days a week or four days a week. For hypertrophy, I learned from Andy that the repetition range can be pretty broad. You think anywhere from six to 30 repetitions, you should do 10 sets per muscle group per week maybe even a bit more high volume, but you have to go to failure or beyond in order to stimulate growth. Why does it work at such a great range of repetitions? Well, there apparently are three ways that you stimulate hypertrophy and maybe more. One is tissue micro damage to the tissue. The other is through some sort of tension based changes in the molecular gene programs of cells that lead to protein synthesis that are distinct from damage. And the other are metabolic effects of like high repetition work of superfusion of the muscle with blood. We know that third category exists because people are now doing this blood restriction training where they cuff off a muscle and they'll use a really light weight. I've done these before. You can use a five pound weight and do curls with this and you're, you are in pain and the muscles are swelling up with blood. It does lead to hypertrophy, but in general, you're not sore. You're not doing tissue damage. And by the way, don't just tourniquet off a muscle because you have to use the proper cuffs um, because you need the blood still to flow in one direction. You can't just cinch it off or you'll, you'll potentially kill yourself if you um, get a clot or you do it wrong. So get the appropriate cuffs, they're out there. And then for endurance, I learned something really cool. So I, I work out basically, I go to the gym every other day on average, I, three or four days a week I do that, but generally not two days in a row. It's workout, next day I'll do cardio, next day. And the cardio for me is always a 30 to 45 minute jog, kind of zone two cardio. Andy informed me that to build endurance while building strength and maintaining some muscle size or even building muscle size, I would be wise to take one day a week and add to that all out max heart rate work for 90 seconds at least. So do 90 seconds, then rest, and then maybe do another 90 second all out sprint. I almost missed my flight going from Los Angeles to Austin. I did that all out sprint in the airport yesterday. 
So I actually can, can think it's done for me. It actually has some carryover effects on, on endurance if you're doing the other stuff. And then he also said one day a week to do this workout and I haven't done it yet. Maybe we do it tomorrow, it'd be fun. Which is you run a mile, you ask yourself, how long did that take? Let's say it took eight minutes. Then you walk or rest for eight minutes. Then you run another mile as fast as you can. And then you rest for the equivalent period. And you do that one to three times once per week. And so as an all around fitness program, you could collapse this into something where you say, okay, you're going to work out with the weights for about an hour every other day. Maybe take two days off every once in a while. Maybe not. You're going to do six to 15 repetitions. You're going to push to failure on some of those, not all, because some of those are designed to build more strength. You're not going to failure and heavier. Some are designed for hypertrophy, higher rep, and going to failure. And then on off days, you're going to jog for 30 or 45 minutes. But for two days a week, you're either at the end of your jog or whatever, you're going to do some all out sprints for 90 seconds and then rest and repeat. And for another day, you're going to do these mile repeats. That's a pretty, that's a pretty large chunk of exercise movement. But if you kind of thread through the middle of all that, what you end up with is some decent strength, building protocols, some decent hypertrophy, some cardiovascular training that establishes the so-called A base or a so-called base. So you're not going to get really good at anything. You're not going to become a marathoner this way, an optimizing marathon. You're not going to optimize powerlifting. You're not going to optimize hypertrophy. But for the typical person, 75% of people, 75% of the time, they want some muscle, they want some strength, they want some endurance, and they want the capacity to sprint to the to the security gate without um, you know leaving a lung in the terminal. And I should mention that cold showers after training don't seem to short circuit the, the training effect to the same extent that immersion in cold water does. And that really speaks to the fact that cold showers, even though they can provide some of the adrenaline for the mental effects of like, oh, I have a lot of adrenaline in my system from a cold shower and I can remain calm. There's, there's utility to that. It's not going to have the same metabolic effects or other positive effects that cold water exposure has been shown to have. And that's unfortunate because most people have access to cold showers. Not everyone has access to a cold dunk or an ice dunk. So there are three ways you can do sauna that I can just toss out as like brief things. If you want to get a really big growth hormone release for sake of metabolism, fat loss, you're training really, really hard in jujitsu and you want to recover, you don't want to sauna too often because the study that um, identified this massive 16 fold increase in growth hormone, they had people do this. It's crazy. They got into, okay, temperatures are 80 to 100 degrees centigrade. So that's 176 degrees Fahrenheit to 212 degrees Fahrenheit for five to 30 minutes is the typical ranges that people work in in these research studies. For maximum growth hormone release, don't do sauna more than once a week, but get into the sauna for 30 minutes, as hot as you can safely tolerate, then get out for five to 10 minutes, no cold exposure, get back in the sauna for 30 minutes. Then they had them do it again, out for five minutes, back for 30 minutes, out for five minutes, back for three minutes. They had them do two hours of sauna exposure to get that growth hormone release. Now for the reduction in likelihood of dying of a cardiovascular event, stroke or otherwise, the more often you do sauna, the better. So if you look at all cause mortality or death due to cardiovascular events, and you look at sauna use frequencies using the same parameters, 80 to 100 degrees centigrade, one to seven times per week. Basically, the more often you get into the sauna for 30 minutes across the week, so 30 minutes a day is better than four times a week. Four times a week is better than two times a week, and two times a week is better than one. And the reductions in mortality are really impressive. If you get into the sauna the way I just described, not the two hours a day, but 30 minutes twice a week or three times per week, you reduce the likelihood of dying of a cardiovascular event by 27%. If you do it four or more times per week, you reduce the probability of dying by 50% of a cardiovascular event. Now, for people that don't have access to a sauna, a hot water bath or hot tub is gonna be your next best bet. And if you don't have access to that, do like the wrestlers do, which is you know put on two sets of uh, sweats and a hoodie and a, and a stocking cap and wrap yourself in plastics underneath all that and go for a run. But don't, please, nobody die of hyperthermia. I mean, you can die of warming up too much. People always ask how cold to make the ice bath or the cold water or the shower. You want it to be uncomfortably cold, meaning you want to feel like I really want to get out, but you can safely stay in. And that's going to vary by person. You want to be uncomfortable in the cold. You want to be uncomfortable in the heat. And this is why I'm not a big fan of infrared saunas because they only go up to about 160, 170 degrees. Infrared light and 
far red light of all kinds has been shown to be beneficial for wound healing, acne, skin, eyes. There are even guys now putting on their testicles because it can increase testosterone and sperm production. Yeah, hormone release. I sometimes enjoy seeing these social media posts where people will get into the ice bath. And they'll look really stoic, like they're really tough. Mm -hmm. um, but actually that's the wimpy way to go through it. When you get into cold water, if you stay very still, you develop a thermal sheath around you oh, that you're warming yourself. The, the really bold way is to get in and continue to sift your arms and legs and it ends up feeling miserably colder because you're, you're breaking, up, the, you're breaking up that thermal layer. And then when you get out, you'll notice a lot of people huddle or they'll, they'll put or they'll grab the towel. In general, that's me. I'll get back, I'll get into the sauna. But if you really want to stimulate the big increases in metabolism, you stand out there and you dry off with arms extended in open air. And as that water evaporates off you, it is really cold, but your body is forced to activate a number of the warming programs related to metabolism. Mm -hmm.